Professor Skip gave some message. Take one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Anna Tess. Well, I first heard about him when he was elected president of the Harvard Law Review. Um, I was a professor at Cornell, and I read about it in the New York Times. And um, I thought, go ahead, little brother. This is a good thing. I thought about writing my letter, but I never did. I had the first party for him on Martha's Vineyard after his famous speech. I didn't know him, uh, but Charles Ogletree, of course, our friend, was his mentor and Michelle's mentor. And he called, and I watched the speech, and I was riveted. And I said, this speech, this is a speech that's made a candidacy. Um, so I watched the speech, and I was exhilarated. It was the perfect speech. A few times in American history has a speech made a person president, but that speech made Barack Obama president. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, the next day, I got a phone call from my friend, uh, Charles Ogletree, professor at the Harvard Law School, who was Barack and Michelle's mentor. And he said that a bunch of people on the vineyard wanted to have a fundraiser for him. He was running for the Senate. But no one had a house big enough. <laughs> and I was renting this beautiful white house um, with a huge lawn. And they said, would you have the party there? I said, absolutely. And I remember... Um, Everybody in the vineyard came. I mean, 400 people showed up. People I didn't even know uh, showed up to meet the young prince. And I had to make a welp welcoming speech. And so I said, um, Senator, welcome to the White House. <laughs> and, and that's indeed what happened. And that's when we first met. But I don't really know Barack Obama. I mean, I've seen him at a few parties. I've seen him at the White House a few times. But I don't know him in the same way that I know the Clintons for example, but he's someone I admire, and I think he's um, very, very sharp, great instincts, uh, intuitive, charming, um, smart enough to marry Michelle, <laughs> so you have to respect a guy like that, and a good father, a great family man. I watch the way his daughters look at him, and he loves them, and uh, they clearly love him. These are values that are very important to me. He has a gift um, only rivaled by Ronald Reagan, and that's the capacity to read a speech as if he owns it. And that's a tough thing to do. I write drafts of speeches for people. Um, I've been involved in political candidacies, um, you know, on the sidelines. I listen to oratory. I study oratory. Um, I teach rhetoric and formal analysis of literature. And he can, he can read a phone book. Like, like Ron, Ronald Reagan could read a phone book as if it's from the heart. And Barack Obama can do the same thing. And it's a, it's a talent. I think that Barack Obama decided or realized that he had to be bilingual, bicultural. Um, he had to appeal to multiple audiences. And he had to master multiple discourses, um, speaking, in the speaking in the black vernacular sometimes to some audiences, even the way he walks. He has that little black swagger, no, swagger. Even the way he walks sometimes. Um, Michael Eric Dyson is hilarious about Obama's walk. I mean, he could be at the getting the Nobel Prize and he walks up, he's got that little black thing in, in there no matter what he sounds like. And I think growing up, he was a multiracial kid in an overwhelmingly um, non-black society. And he had to learn how, how to communicate across apparent racial divisions. And I think he's a master at that. Oh, I used to have arguments with um, my dear friend Larry Bobo, now dean of the social sciences at Harvard. He said, what's wrong with you? This guy's going to be president, the first black president. But one of my principal values is loyalty. And um, I've known the Clintons for a long, long time. Um, we have an easy, warm relationship. 
I had many small dinners on Martha's Vineyard, introduced to them uh, by and through Vernon Jordan. I've been with them at moments of great triumph and moments of great challenge, shall we say. Um, I thought Bill Clinton was one of the greatest presidents in the history of the United States. And I think Hillary would have been one of the smartest, most effective presidents in the history of the United States. And I thought it was her turn. And I wasn't going to turn my back uh, on my friends, though if she was going to lose, I wanted her to lose to the black guy. You know, I wanted him to win. So, but I wasn't going to pretend, or be, and I wasn't going to be a hypocrite about it. You know, I'm a, I'm a friend of the Clintons, like John Lewis. And John and I made the move toward Barack Obama at the same time. I was watching the Iowa primaries from a friend's house in Woodlawn, Silicon Valley. And um, I couldn't believe it. Um, Barack Obama took Iowa, that this overwhelmingly white constituency saw him as the next president of the United States. They didn't think that it was unimaginable anymore. And if he could win in Iowa, Iowa played the same role for Barack Obama that West Virginia played for John Kennedy in the 1960 campaign. You have to remember in 1960, no one thought a Roman Catholic could be president of the United States. So the pivotal primary was the state of West Virginia, which is overwhelmingly religious, Christian, and Protestant. If he could win West Virginia, if he could defeat Hubert Humphrey in the West Virginia primary, then he could win the country. And no one thought he could pull it off. And he went down there. He never uh, denied his religion. He never walked away from it. He embraced it. And people embraced him. He spoke from the heart. And my fellow West Virginians said, he might be Roman Catholic, but he's a good man in spite of it. <laughs> and the same thing happened with Barack in, in Iowa. He spoke from his heart. And people looked past um, what had been traditional obstacles to election, that is one skin color, particularly to a election at the White House, and said, that's the man we want to see as the next president of the United States. Um, and he did it. And right after that, it's not like John Lewis called me, but we came to the same decision at the same day. It was time to move. And of course, Hillary won New Hampshire, um, but it, it was uh, a rebound effect. And the, the next primary, Barack won. Then he went on to win South Carolina. Now, of course, Jesse Jackson won South Carolina. But the enthusiasm um, for his candidacy, Jesse's victory was symbolic. And let me be clear. I think most historians would agree that without Jesse Jackson in 84 and 88, there'd be no Barack Obama. Um, we all have a tendency to think we created ourselves, but we didn't. We're the result of a long set of historical factors. And um, Barack should always remember that Jesse was there and Jesse paved the way. Um, but when he won South Carolina, so many black people came out and so enthusiastically. Um, I knew just by the looks on their faces that we were seeing a, a movement born. Iowa close in New Hampshire, um, fabulous victory in, in South Carolina. It was time to, to embrace him. Um, and he called me. <clears throat> Michael Eric Dyson was an early Obama supporter. And he made Obama, he kept saying, you got to call Skip Gates, you got to call. So I don't know why. So one day my phone rang, and it was Barack Obama with Dyson. Said he, Dyson probably dialed the phone. And, um, I said, you know, very proud of you. Keep it up if I can ever help. Um, let me know. And when he won, I was at Bobo's house, and Larry Bobo and his wife, Marcelina Morgan, um, William Julius Wilson, a few other Harvard professors, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, and we watched and we, we were afraid of that, um, the Wisconsin effect, you know, Jesse went to bed one night. He was winning, going to win Wisconsin. He woke up the next day, and he had lost. So none of us allowed ourselves to be happy. But when Wolf Blitzer called it, I mean, I cried just like everybody else.
His election was an example of history overruling the abomination of the three-fifths clause in the United States Constitution. Uh, very few people think of it that way. But, you know, the founders, at least ideally, wanted to rid our country of hereditary-based obstacles like property ownership, religion. Uh, they weren't so good about race. But we could debate about whether the Constitution uh, was a pro-slavery document. Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison had that debate. Douglass initially thought so, but then he changed his mind. He thought that there was enough room for maneuverability. Well, um, Barack Obama proved Frederick Douglass right. And that abominable three-fifths clause bit the dust. No one said that that night in the coverage, but that's what I thought of, uh, that that horrible compromise at the Constitutional Convention was now completely buried, just as the stigma or the obstacle of being a Roman Catholic was buried by John Kennedy's election in, in 1960. Black people, the enslaved black people in the South, were counted in the census not as a full human being, but as three-fifths of a human being. Um, and that was to uh, give the South a certain weight in the Electoral College. So many people have written about being defined as three-fifths of a man. Imagine if you were defined as three-fifths of a human being. That's how black people are inscribed in the Constitution. The word slave never appears in the Constitution. But three-fifths of a human being does appear in the Constitution. That's how slavery is inscribed. And that is, a re and race, therefore, was inscribed as an hereditary obstacle toward holding office and toward voting. Even free Negroes in the North, by 1860, could only vote in five states. So the, the relationship between race and the electorate was enormously vexed uh, in this country, as, as you well know. One of the ways that black people fought back against the rise of white supremacy was to invent a concept of a new Negro. Now, why would they do that? They did that because there were so many stereotypes as part of white supremacy about the old Negro, the freedmen, the freed women, the formerly enslaved. So upper-class, well-educated black people, starting in 1894, invented a concept called the New Negro. And th the history of the New Negro goes through many iterations between 1894 and 1925. In 1895, Booker T. Washington, just like Barack Obama, Booker T. Washington at the Atlanta Exposition in 1895 gives a speech that makes him the heir of Frederick Douglass. Douglass dies in February 1895. Booker T. Washington makes a speech, one speech, at the Atlanta Exposition, it was like the World's Fair, in September of 1895. And overnight, he is hailed by the white press as the new Negro. And five years later, he publishes a book which he edits with two other people called A New Negro for a New Century. And this concept goes through different iterations, reaches its apex at the height of the Harlem Renaissance in 1925. So it was a metaphor that was defined with different content. For some people, a new Negro was like Booker T. Weiss. For some people, it was like W.E.B. Du Bois who started the Niagara Movement and the NAACP. For some people, like Alain Locke, the new Negro was, was going to defeat racism through culture. For Marcus Garvey, a new Negro was a black nationalist. For A. Philip Randolph, a new Negro was a militant socialist who had learned to shoot in World War I and would sh shoot the Klan. They put a big um, cartoon in the Messenger magazine of the new Negro shooting the Ku Klux Klan running off in the distance. I was astonished that even before he was elected, I was astonished that even before he was elected, certain black commentators started comparing him to the new Negro. One article is even headlined, the new Negro in the new politics. Charles Johnson, a brilliant novelist, a sober, astute philosopher, you know, wrote an essay in which he um, sees Barack and Michelle as a new kind of black person, something sui generis, something unprecedented in 
the history of the race and that we were going to have to change the way we described uh, race relations in America because of the coming of this couple. That's the same rhetoric of the new Negro at the turn of the century. Another political scientist talked about his significance as literally the new Negro uh, in politics. That's ridiculous. With all due respect to my friend Charles Johnson, there is only one Negro, this is the old Negro, there never was a new Negro. They were just black people. And they were part of a long tradition, both Michelle and Barack. Um, there wasn't a break with the past, they were an extension of the past. They didn't redefine the past, they embodied the best of the past. It was a culmination of a lot of dreams and a lot of hopes, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of tears, a lot of lynchings, a lot of beatings, a lot of terrorism, a lot of prayers, a lot of hard work in schools, a lot of deferred gratification. Barack and Michelle are a culmination of hundreds of years of uh, dreams deferred, as Langston Hughes put it. So I don't think that Barack and Michelle were guilty of seeing themselves as breaks with the past. But people around them definitely were, and commentators definitely were. They wanted to see them as somehow different. I'm different than these other um, Negroes, as we used to say. That somehow they were unlike um, African Americans, that they had redefined the possibility of an African American. And as a race man, as someone who teaches African American history, I know that wasn't true. They were an extension of the best of the African American tradition. And that new Negro fantasy had an unfortunate effect, which was to lead to a claim of a new America overnight post-racial America was born because of the election of Barack Obama. That is totally and utterly ridiculous. This discourse of a post-racial America was a fantasy. And I think it had deleterious effects in our society. People, Americans want a quick fix. Okay, we elected a black man, stop complaining. No more racism, no more NAACP, no more discrimination. Do we really need affirmative action? What are you guys complaining about? You got Barack and Michelle in the White House. Um, and if anyone doubts that post-racial America was not born, just take a quick look at who's living at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue today. Having that lovely, loving, wonderful, bright, brilliant nuclear family of brown faces in the White House for eight years inspired many of us. Um, I couldn't believe it some days. But it also drove many other of us totally and completely crazy. I was astonished. But when I saw those long lines of people, many of whom I grew up with back in West Virginia, um, waiting to vote on election night when Donald Trump was running against Hillary, I thought, because those lines reminded me the patience of people in those lines, their level of expectation, their determination. I said, my God, it reminds me exactly of the lines of black people, particularly in Barack's first, um, first presidential election. And I thought, this is going to be a long night. And I couldn't believe it. And of course, disaster happened as far as I'm concerned, and Hillary Clinton lost. I was always wary, too, of Obama's handlers saying he was the smartest guy in the room. I teach at Harvard. I've been here 27 years. There's no smartest guy in the room. You're in the room with a lot of smart women and men. You didn't, they didn't have to position him as the smartest person in the room. He was smart enough to surround himself with smart people, smart enough to seek advice, smart en enough in private to admit what he didn't know, and to spend a lot of time learning. He's a very good student. He would, as I understand it, um, have dinner with his family, and then go up and work. I mean, study, learn about things. The, the way that 
He managed the recession of 2008, was a masterpiece. Uh, he was a, like a, a, a brilliant conductor of a, a symphony, appointing Steve Ratner as a car czar and letting Ratner do what he did. Just like magic, and it was beautiful. And Obama could orchestrate. I think his biggest achievement a thousand years from now will be that he was the first black man elected as president of the United States. And anyone who doubts that that's a big deal should just look at the White House today. That seems like an impossible barrier to cross, given what's happened to the presidency since Donald Trump was elected. The history of race in America cannot be overturned through one bright shining moment called the election of the prince of a man named Barack Hussein Obama. You just can't get rid of centuries of slavery, economic oppression, racial prejudice, and its corollary, white supremacy, by snapping your fingers, even um, through an event as glorious as the election of the first black president. It was still there, and it had to be met head on. Um, by embracing a rhetoric that somehow we were post-racial, I don't think that helped us to deal with these seething forces underground that we had inherited, first from slavery, but really from the rollback to Reconstruction. In 1867, because of the Military Reconstruction Act, black men in the former Confederacy were allowed to register and vote. And incredibly, in 1868, 80% of all eligible black men voted. This scared the daylights out of the former Confederates, and it scared the daylights, too, out of many white people in the North who couldn't imagine that black power would express itself through people who were essentially illiterate. Remember, they were just out of slavery for three years by 1868. They'd been illegal to read and write. They had been learning in churches and through freedmen's schools. But essentially, it was a largely illiterate male electorate. And these men voted. And a state like South Carolina basically was run like a black state. Um, so there's a power in the ballot. That's why it was taken away. That's why Reconstruction ended. And of course, they needed cheap labor because cotton remained the leading export in this country uh, even beyond 1930. So they had to reinvent slavery and disenfranchise black men, which is why it took a civil rights movement to get the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, a century after the Civil War. So. Voting rights, holding office, that was the ultimate, the ultimate symbol of white resistance. And Barack Obama's election overcame that and buried the three-fifth compromise in the original, um, and buried the three-fifth compromise, the notion that black people were three-fifths of a man, as it were, which is inscribed in the United States Constitution. Barack Obama was elected as the president of all the people, not the president of black people. And so he had to wear his blackness inevitably on his face, but he had to demonstrate every day that he represented people who didn't look like him, who didn't share his physical characteristics, who um, didn't embrace his phenotype, as it were. And I think he did a good job of that. He couldn't be too black. He could be black at night. He had a lot of really good parties. <laughs> um, and he was black as he wanted to be. But in the daytime, he had to be polka dot. <laughs> he had to be neutral. He had to be multicolored. And I think he did a very good job of that. And he um, tuned his rhetoric for black audiences and, and white audiences. He pulled his punches um, when he had to. I think that many black people eventually found his lectures about black agency, 
black individual accountability, black responsibility for the conditions plaguing black people, uh, tedious. Because it was obvious that he was really addressing, while ostensibly addressing members of the black community, there was a feeling he really was addressing his white imaginary constituency and his white actual constituency too, uh, trying to convince them that he wasn't too black, that he was willing to stand up within the black community and say tough things, difficult things, and not pander to people who were um, making bad judgments and committing um, unacceptable acts. I, um, I think it was necessary for him to do that. But after a while, as I say, it became predictable. It was like on the one hand, on the other. On the one hand, it became a formula. And um, I, I think some people rightfully became resentful. Was, he, was what he was saying wrong? No. Black responsibility. The causes of poverty are both structural and behavioral. That's what he said. Barack Obama's message was the causes of poverty are both structural, meaning historical, socioeconomic, but also behavioral. People making bad choices, bad decisions, um, not deferring gratification, um, not learning their ABCs. But the reason they were making bad decisions and not learning their ABCs and their multiplication tables, et cetera, were also related to larger structural problems. So it's, on the one hand, we can talk about them in two different breaths, but on the other hand, they are inextricably intertwined. Um, he also learned a lesson from Bill Clinton, which is a rising tide lifts all boats. So his economic cures weren't race specific. Um, they were class specific. And I think that he was acutely aware of the problems of wealth inequity, wealth inequality, the difference between um, work and wealth. We grew up, there was a promise that work, if your mother and father, generally your father, if you're my age, worked, that maybe some wealth accumulation could occur. Now it's clear that if you own capital, if you're in possession of capital, that your um, percentage of increase in your total wealth is going to be much greater than someone who's working every day for a living with basically no capital. Um, and I, I think that Obama was sensitive to that, um, the, the so-called problem of the 1% and the 1% within the 1%. Um, and I think that in retrospect, he wanted to see um, an economy based on the free market, but with a social safety net. Um, not in the, the extreme left forms that Bernie Sanders, a person I enormously admire, advocated, or maybe you know, my friend Elizabeth Warren is advocating, and, but certainly not the laissez-faire economics or the trickle-down fantasy of um, Reaganesque or, or Trumpian economics. Um, and I think that could be a great legacy of President Obama as well. Certainly, health care. Everyone from you know, Harry Truman had tried to get some kind of modification of the health care system. Um, Bill Clinton did. Only Barack pulled it off at a huge political cost with a lot of compromises. But it was scandalous that in a country as wealthy as ours, um, 20 million people, estimates range from 12 million to 40 million, people who didn't have any kind of health care would be forced to live life like that. That was a scandal. And now because of Obamacare, which Trump is chipping away at, um, we've addressed that situation and I hope that it survives, but it's out of his, out of his control. I tell my students that there are two streams that are running under the floorboards of Western culture. And one is anti-Semitism and one is anti-black. I tell my students that there are two streams running under the floorboards of Western culture. One is anti-Semitism, 
and running parallel to it is anti-black racism. And the myth of a post-racial America because of the election of a black man to the White House let us, um, unfortunately, put our guard down. You know, we thought, well, maybe things are better. Maybe white supremacy is a thing of the past. Maybe it's something that our grandchildren will only know about through history books. And they'll say, why would anyone think that a person, simply because they were black, had been barred by something that was um, hereditary from holding office or casting a ballot? But those forces are back. They hadn't disappeared. They were just papered over. Think about those times that you say something inadvertently, innocently, from your heart, and it hurts someone's feelings, it frightens them, it makes them angry. That's what happened to Barack Obama. Um, I think what he said was true uh, from his heart. I think, I think he felt that what he said was true and something he spoke from his heart. But the backlash is the same. The backlash produces the same effect when you inadvertently hurt someone's feeling or you offend them um, or when you touch a raw nerve and you, all you could say is, look, I didn't mean it that way. And then you go to great lengths um, to assuage their pain, um, to reassure them that you won't do it again, that I didn't mean it in the way that you hurt it. W.E.B. Du Bois, in one of the classics of the black tradition, called The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903, um, defined the double consciousness of every African American. And Du Bois said, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two warring ideals in one dark body. That was a challenge that Barack Obama had to confront. How did he reconcile um, being black, reacting to the world as a black man, expressing his black subjectivity with being the president of all the people who live in America? There never has been a more classic example of Du Bois's dilemma than Barack Obama and his eight years in the White House uh, because I'm sure he felt about, passionately, about many racial uh, matters, but he had to express his concern in a rhetoric that didn't terrify um, his white constituency, didn't awake the nightmare of white supremacy. Um, people, people who they never dreamed they would vote for a black man voted for him because they thought Somehow, he was different. You know, he was black, yes, but not too black, meaning not a black nationalist. And when um, he spoke about Trayvon Martin, I think he, he took the mask off. I mean, he said, this could have been my son. I mean, but it was so authentic, so moving. I don't think that um, it alienated his constituency. But it took him a long time to get back to that moment when he took the mask off, when, when being an American and being a Negro, as it were, in Du Bois's terms, could be one thing. And he spoke like a human being, reacting as a black man, but speaking to the human community in, through the ultimately personal, through the ultimate personal metaphor, which is one's own son. And so I, I don't think that that was rehearsed. I think it was um, spontaneous, but he'd received a lot of criticism. Cornell West, Mike Ware Dyson, lots of people had said, come on, you know, you have to, you're black too. You know, you can't forget your black side. You have to play and bridge the duality, but you have to be both. You have to speak to your black constituency and not just hectoring, um, but in a compassionate way in order to generate compassion from your non-black constituency. I, th I think it took him a long time to do it. I think it took him a long time to do that. 
And also you had advisors who were looking at poll numbers and they go, look, it's a white country. You can only be so black. You know, you got to decide. How black do you want to be? <laughs> you want to still be president? You want your ratings to go up? Um, I think that would be, it must have been true for John Kennedy with Roman Catholics. I think we still haven't had our first Jewish president. I hope it's Michael Bloomberg. And I think that's something he'll wrestle with as well. Uh, it wasn't a cynical thing. It wasn't hypocritical. It was political. But he's a political being in a political office. You know, we're not talking about um, how a person actually feels in the privacy of their home with their friends. We're talking about your message embedded in political rhetoric, speaking from the White House to 300 American people. When you're elected to the White House, you stop being a black person first. You're president first. You're, you're not a black man who's president. You're a president who happens to be black. But he's a president who happens to be black and, and a bunch of other things, like a Democrat and a good swimmer. Um, and a person, I don't know, who likes pineapple juice. <laughs> you know, I don't know what. Um, so that he has multiple identities, I'm trying to say. And he has to speak to a constituency that is multiply identified. And I think he did a good job at doing that. Though it was very frustrating for many black people for a lot of time. South Carolina was the blackest state in the Union. Even in the 18th century, its name was a Negro country. So if you think about the history of racism and white supremacy, many of the most heinous examples have manifested themselves in South Carolina. Why? Because there was a black majority at, at certain periods in, in history. So as soon as I heard, I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that someone would actually pray with a group of people on a Wednesday night for an hour and then kill them. I can understand, you know, we've all heard of acts of terror when somebody knocks the door down and just shoots people with an automatic rifle. But to think about it for an hour uh, and then kill them. So then, um, as the facts came out, we learned that he's a white supremacist. Dylan Roof didn't need to read um, Louis Agassiz's Good Harvard Man's ridiculous theories about um, polygenesis and the uh, subhuman nature of people of African descent. Or he didn't need to read uh, Vardaman's speech about why we are um, in the constitutional, in the redemption constitutional conventions, why we are instituting poll taxes and literacy tests and examinations. It wasn't about, as he says, disenfranchising uneducated poor white people. It was about disenfranchising black people, and he used the N-word. And he said, let's make no bones about that. White supremacy is in the DNA of the American people generally, and the South more especially. Um, it's in the air that you breathe. And Dylan Roof had imbued this horrendous blanket of hate and extremism. It was just part of his being. And, and, and it's no accident either that he picked Mother Emanuel. Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It was opened up in 1865 after it had been closed after the Den Denmark Vesey slave rebellion. And they brought him from Boston, and then he is elected to Congress, the minister. It's no accident that this horrendous act occurred at Mother Emanuel AME Church, because Mother Emanuel played a pivotal role in the history of Reconstruction. Denmark Vesey's slave rebellion in Charleston in 18. 22 was connected with the church, so they, the people who suppressed the, that rebellion shut the church down. It wasn't opened again until 1865 when the church sent a minister from the north to revitalize the church. His name was Richard Kane, and he used the church to 
uh, teach literacy to the slaves and to encourage political action. And he himself became involved in politics and was elected to Congress. So the church where the murders occurred played a huge role in the uh, victory of the North over the South and in the suppression of white supremacy for about 10 years. And then, of course, redemption, rolled back, um, reconstruction. But the church continued to play a role in terms of the education of black people and in terms of their political involvement until, of course, the uh, state constitutional convention basically disenfranchised black people. But church didn't die, didn't stop being political. It bided its time. And then the modern civil rights era under Martin Luther King, the church again was a vehicle for that. It's organ of expression, um, a way that people met for political protests. So it's not a surprise that, I mean, it, these murders occurred at a pivotal site in the history of the civil rights movement, a pivotal site that fought white supremacy. So when Dylan Roof, a self-styled white supremacist, wanted to make a political statement, where did he do it? At Mother Emanuel Church, which was imbricated in the history of the fight for black rights from the 19th century on. I thought that the president's speech was um, deeply moving. Um, and we all learned that he has a pretty good voice, too. <laughs> Presidents are expected at times of tragedy to uh, console. Um, and I think that he'll be remembered as a, a figure of consolation in times of unimaginable tragedy, like the murders of the school kids. And I think that he's a deeply compassionate person um, for all sorts of unimaginably horrific anti-humane acts. And I, I think that um, we saw that in his reaction to the murders of the school children. And we saw that certainly at Mother Emanuel Church. He spoke from his heart, without doubt. Is Donald Trump's election a direct response to Barack Obama's presidency? Many people think so. Um, but it's not as if Barack Obama was Marcus Garvey or Malcolm X. I mean, he, he was the most middle of the road um, assimilation as president of African-American descent that one could imagine. So it wasn't because of, of strident militancy. It wasn't because of favoritism to the black community. It wasn't because he was primarily a race man. I think it was because of the long legacy of white supremacy. I, th I think people were more shocked at the rise and expression of white supremacy because, precisely because, so many well-intentioned people had fostered the illusion that a black man's election had defeated and finally buried white supremacy. And that wasn't true. And we knew it wasn't true. The fictions of a post-racial America were a joke. I used to watch commentators, I mean, black people I know, talking about all the old days when there was racism. I'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, what, what profits are being made uh, from advancing that argument? And I don't mean literally in terms of, I, I want to take that. I don't want to like, uh, make, it look, make it look like people were um, selling out for money. But let me say it this way. I could never understood what anyone thought the society was gaining by pretending that the election of one man, no matter how brilliant, no matter how charming, um, no matter how compelling their family relationship might be, that that one event could erase three centuries of oppression, the stigma of racism, um, the forms of multiple forms of white supremacy that developed first during slavery, then were challenged during 10 years of Reconstruction, 11 years of Reconstruction, 
then the long period of redemption or the rollback of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, that somehow Barack Obama's election um, was going to wipe, wipe that out, that's ridiculous. And actually, it's offensive to one's intelligence. But it was a, a fiction that was doing work for a part of the community. That somehow, we've changed. America's changed. All that's behind us. How much had America changed because it had finally gotten rid of this hereditary barrier to occupancy of the White House, that is race. Well, it turned out it had changed a lot um, for a day, <laughs> the election day, but had it fundamentally changed? Did it lower the number of black men going to prison? Did it lower the child poverty rate? Uh, did it lower the unemployment rate? Did it uh, lower the number of people who think affirmative action um, allows people who are not qualified or less qualified to take the positions of good, hardworking people who are qualified? Absolutely not. By pretending that these race-based problems had been solved, it was a bit like um, uh, going to a faith healer um, when you have cancer, you know, and saying, Cancer's gone. You know, the minister told me the cancer was gone. And it's not, you're going to die of cancer unless you get systematic um, scientific treatment. So, to some extent, the post racial discourse kept us from dealing with real problems of race and racism with deep and entangled roots in American history and which can't be explained away or wished away through the fantasy of post-racialism and the New Negro. January 20, 2017, President Obama tweeted farewell twice to the nation. It's been the honor of my life to serve you. And I could just see him in, in tears when it had to be a sad day for him. It's been the honor of my life to serve you. You made me a better leader and a better man. I won't stop. I'll be right there with you as a citizen, inspired by your voices of truth and justice, good humor and love. Barack Obama. Reply to POTUS 44. You're not a citizen. You weren't even born here. America has finally defeated you. Now, back to Kenya you go, ape. In that tweet, you see embodied principal tropes of white supremacy. First, that black people aren't citizens, don't have a right to be citizens. Black people only became citizens with the ratification of the 14th Amendment. That's the first thing. You weren't even born here, birthright citizenship. America has finally defeated you. Now go back to where you're originally from, Kenya, or by extension for all black people, Africa, you ape. You're not, you people aren't um, a member of the human community. You're at the top of the animal kingdom. Under Europeans or what? People, other people of color, then at the bottom of the human community, the Africans, who's under the Africans? Apes. And a lot of white supremacists say there is no line between the ape and the African. This person, again, without studying the history of white supremacy, embodies the key metaphors or tropes of anti-black racism in this pathetic little tweet saying to the president, you think you defeated racism? You think you changed history? Got news for you. We're still here. And these people came up out of the center of the earth, um, re-emergent and stronger than ever. And these people, this person wasn't alone. There were many people who shared these beliefs and they emerged out of the center of the earth like zombies that we thought had long been put out of business. Um, and um, that's that.